I always tell everybody when you start seeing football on TV, it's time to get your prostate check. Okay. I love so that. I, October is breast cancer awareness, right? right? So when football season comes on, it's time to get your prostate checked. Man up, get checked. You're not being a, a strong guy by trying to, to hide it. Cancer is just something that we all have to recognize, acknowledge, cope with, live with, struggle with, rage upon, crush, and even thrive with. This show is more than knowing and fighting or beating cancer. It's more than just relaying science, hope, and technology. Together, our purpose is to demystify cancer, take away as much fear out of the diagnosis, treatment, and process as we can, defeat its grip on our lives. This is The Cancering Show. Hi, welcome to The Cancering Show. Today, we're going to dive into men's health. And honestly, it's been a minute since we've covered this topic, and I'm excited to bring you this show. I've invited my friend and colleague, Dr. Christopher Keel, to join us today. He's the chair of urology at USA Health at the University of South Alabama. He's going to be giving his perspective on men's health and in particular screening for prostate cancer. We're also going to talk about why a lot of men avoid seeing the doctor altogether. Dr. Keel, welcome to the show. Thank you. I am so excited to have you here. We haven't had a really extensive conversation about men's health on the podcast in a long time. So we're excited to have you and your expertise here. Well, I'm glad to be here. So talk to us first, what makes men's health kind of different from women's health when we talk about why guys do or don't go to the doctor and what doctors they specifically need to see? Guys never go to the doctor. What are you talking about? They don't want to go to the doctor. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, men's health, it's a big word. does it, A lot of times people talk about men's health, they talk about prostate cancer. A lot of times people talk about men's health, they talk about erectile dysfunction. I think erectile dysfunction has driven a lot of our diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer uh, since the invent of Viagra. I think you could probably argue that that Pfizer and that, that team, when they released Viagra, probably did more for prostate cancer awareness than any drug that has ever come to the market for cancer. You know, that was I a never knew drug. that. Yeah, yeah. So, but men's health, I mean, I think guys, you know, guys typically have, bury their head in the sand. Unless they're hurting, they don't go to the doctor. And nine times out of ten, they don't go to the doctor when they're hurting. Right. Um, so that's, I talk, to, I talk to guys, I say, you know, bring your wife back next time so that I can actually get some real info out of you. I think there's this misperceived notion that uh, they're gonna that they're gonna get diagnosed with something that they don't that they don't want to that they don't want to know about. So I mean I think that's part of it. I don't think most people are scared of needles anymore. They're certainly scared of rectal exams, but we don't do that as much anymore as we used to. So right, yeah. And so when you're saying for men's health, what should men be doing about prostate cancer or yeah. um, any type of you know? Well, when I see when I talk to prevention. a guy, yeah. So when you talk to a guy about prevention cancer, most of the guys that we see for prostate cancer, they should be starting to get screened around forty to forty five, depending on their depending on their family history, and we'll, we can talk about that too. When I see them, I talk to them about colonoscopy. I mean, that's something that guys overlook because they don't want to do the prep, they don't want to take two days off of work and all that stuff. But talking to some of our colorectal surgeons, and I'm sure you've probably talked to them on this show before, they like that's the only cancer that we can prevent. Right. Except so why for not, cervical cancer. Well, except yeah. for cervical cancer exactly. now because of Gardasil or whatever. But yeah. So, but you know, it's it, it. I guess it was the first cancer that we were able to prevent. So I talk to guys about prevention when I see them about screening and prostate cancer is about early detection. Exactly. Uh, um, we can talk about prevention and there's things that you can do to help lower your risk, just like any cancer. Right. You don't smoke. You don't have as high a risk for lung cancer, but. You know, there's things that you can do to help prevent prostate cancer, but you're not going to – it's all about early detection, and that's what we're trying to get guys into the office for is do early detection on them. Well, we've talked about PSA testing. Yes. You've talked about rectal exams. You even talked about Viagra helping with diagnosis. Can you link those three for sure. us? So before – so PSA came out in the late, early 90s, and then Viagra came out in the late 90s. And so PSA testing was – like before that, it was just the rectal exam. And so guys would be – they'd come in for a rectal exam once a year. You'd sometimes catch cancer early. You could treat it. Um, that was – and then just a – Early 80s, we started doing prostatectomy really well. I mean, I, you could argue whether or not it was done well then. Um, it's certainly a lot better now. And so those patients would come in, but they didn't want a rectal exam. And then they didn't know about PSA. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, you have Didka get on the Super Bowl and talk about erectile dysfunction. And everybody's like, oh, wait, I can go to the doctor and get something for that now. Before then, there was nothing. I mean, there was, there was no really good um, 
treatment for erectile dysfunction other than surgery or injections. And so now you have this huge group of, of men who were suffering in silence that now would come to the doctor. And, oh, by the way, while you're here, we'll get your PSA. So then it, this started this huge movement of early screening for prostate cancer. That led to probably over-treatment. Yeah. So we can talk about that if you want to. And then now I think the, the pendulum is swinging back um, after, you know, the – the overtreatment scare of the of 2000 and I'd say 2013 or whatever. Now the past 10 years, everybody's tried to play catch up because we've seen stuff change since then. So it's been an interesting ride the past 20 years in prostate cancer. I bet. I bet even the robotics has been a huge change in the last 20 years. Talk yeah. to us about robotics. Sure. Yeah. Robotics came out in 20, 2001, I think, is when it first got FDA approved. Or maybe that's when we started doing prostatectomies on it. But yeah, I mean, that's completely revolutionized prostate cancer treatment. I mean, my grandfather had a prostatectomy in 1998 at Vanderbilt. Jay Smith did his prostatectomy. Jay's arguably one of the best prostatectomists in the world. He uh, and he spent a week in the hospital at Vanderbilt, got two units of blood. Um, now we do a single port prostatectomy through a two inch incision and send him home the same day. So, amazing. I mean, it's amazing the difference. Um, you know, my grandfather had he had all the side effects, of prostate cancer treatment, surgical treatment with erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. I mean, I didn't know about that until after he was dead. But yeah. I was just going to ask if he's still alive. We're going to need a like signed yeah. form from yeah. him. So. Yeah, no, he's he's dead. But I found out all this stuff after I went through my training and talked to my parents about it. But yeah, so he had all those things. I mean, and you know, back then the best surgeon, one of the best surgeons in the world, did a surgery, and he still had all those things. And now, right. I mean, I talk to guys. I think that's one of the drivers for men not want to get it checked they don't want to they don't want those side effects and so i tell guys when i give lectures or if i talk to patients i say this isn't your grandfather's prostatectomy like this is not the same type of surgery that we used to do even though it's still a prostatectomy even though the code when we build the code is still the same right. it's still not the same and we don't i don't do them the same as i did 10 years ago so my my treatment just using the robot has evolved quite a bit the past 10 years so um, yeah, and, big, big change with technology. And I think that means that all those side effects, particularly erectile dysfunction, are less now. Yeah, I mean, erectile dysfunction, I, I would say that everything has improved. I think we've seen the biggest jump in incontinence, which most men, and I tell them, I'm like, look, I know you're worried about your erections pre-op, but post-op, you're going to be worried if you're leaking. And I would tell most guys they don't leak after a robotic prostatectomy these days. I mean, I would be, I'm very surprised if they do, so... And that's a huge improvement. Yeah, yeah, huge improvement. And you were talking before we um, started recording about a new center for both voiding dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, and the post-op um, yeah, yeah. assistance. So, yeah, so one of the things, this was an interesting uh, way that I did this. So when I was in practice in Tennessee, I would start, I would send patients, if they had any incontinence after their prostatectomy, I'd send them to physical therapy, which was a standard way of doing things. And, um, or, and, my scheduler actually misscheduled somebody and sent them beforehand. And so they came back, you know, six weeks later and I said, how's the leakage going? Well, I never leaked that those exercises they taught me worked. And I said, what exercises you hadn't been sent yet? Cause you, and he, so it turns out he went pre-op. So we started sending everybody pre-op and, and it worked great. So now what we do is we send everybody for pre-op physical therapy before their prostatectomy. And that has helped drive down our incontinence rates quite a bit. And so we've seen the value in having that all together. And so um, we are creating some synergy within our department and, and in combination with some of the some of the women's health stuff that we do. And we've created a center for voiding dysfunction. And we haven't really named it yet, but I guess that's that's probably a good name. Um, but yeah, so we're creating that uh, on the third floor of our office building. And so, or if any of your grateful patients out there would like to have their name on it, I'm go. sure you, you would go. be yeah, delighted. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. And, you know, we were just saying it also is for women and women after cancer treatment, cancer surgery, have a lot of the same issues, yep, including sure. sexual dysfunction. Yep. And that both the incontinence and sexual dysfunction so important to treat with physical therapy and, you know, just a center of people who know what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And we've we are formulating a men's when you, we talk about men's health. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're formulating a men's health center, too, so that we can address the sexual issues of that men have not even even not post prostatectomy but in men that that have it that you know for various other reasons so spinal cord injuries all kinds of things so 
Sure. I'm going to take you back to screening for a second. And we talked about PSAs, but we know we're learning more now about all of the cancers that are associated with genetic syndromes. Some that are linked between the two of us, the BRCA mutation Mm -hmm. um, causing an increased risk, not just of ovarian and breast cancer, but also prostate cancer. Talk to me about some of the patients that you send for genetic testing, and then how do you counsel them afterwards? Sure. Uh, yeah, genetics. I mean, I think it, what's really interesting. I'm old enough to remember when I, I'm old enough to remember professors that knew Watson and Crick. It's crazy, but um, genetics and Rosalind Franklin. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy, and and it's just revolutionized the way that we're treating stuff. Prostate cancer, just like breast cancer, colon cancer. I mean, it's we've found all these genetic things. BRCA is one of them that you mentioned. You know, we talk about ATM mutations too and uh, microsatellite instability. Those are kind of buzzwords in the community right now. I think that we've probably found more than we know what to do with because we've found all these genes. We don't quite know what to do with a lot of them. I think the new the new thing that's coming out in prostate cancer is going to be PARP inhibitors, and that's for treatment of currently for treatment of advanced can, uh, advanced cancers. And I think y'all are using that for breast cancer, and I think maybe some kind of. So I think cancers. it started with ovarian cancer, and we've okay. actually moved it from treatment of advanced cancer all the way to first right, line, which is going to probably what yeah. happens yeah. with uh, prostate cancer too. The um, and so the, to get on those drugs, you have to have certain genetic mutations, just like with ovarian. The um, when we talk about screening men, probably just like you guys do with ovarian or, or any other type of malignancy, it's people that are high risk. So generally, if you come in with a run of the mill, just low grade, grade group one prostate cancer, that's probably not going to need genetic screening unless you have, hey, my grandfather, my dad, my brother, like, you know, you have this family history. So there's a set criteria for that. But generally, most men that have high risk, intermediate to high risk disease get some type of genetic testing. And we yeah. do germline testing on everybody. Some of our patients don't even know that we they get tested because our pathologist just does that. So from the biopsy specimen itself. Right. So very similar, I think, to many of our cancers on the GYN side. And then, you know, what you were discussing was really this idea of targeted therapy. So yeah. oral drugs that go to specific mutations really has revolutionized cancer in general. Yeah. So like when we talk about doing germline testing or like these are a couple of buzzwords, people talk about germline or somatic testing. Germline testing is when we do genetic tests to test the patient to see if they have any inherited genes, mutations. Somatic testing is when we test the tumor, and that's to test whether or not they have any targets that that would be amenable to treatment with like a targeted therapy, such as Keytruda, Opdivo, or one of those immunotherapies that we now can use. I think that's one of the most amazing things that's happened in cancer in the past 15 years. I mean, it's just amazing the opportunities that we have to treat patients. And I can go down a rabbit hole and geek out really bad about this stuff, but we got a minute. Go yeah. for it. <laughs> when I finished training, so I finished training in 2014. And so in 10 years, we've gone from having one, essentially one drug when I was, so abiaterone is a type of drug that got approved and it's now generic, but it got approved in 2013 or 2014. But when I really learned how to treat prostate cancer, we had one drug. It was androgen deprivation therapy. I mean, yeah. that was pretty much it. And you had biclutamide, which was an old drug that had been used. That was the only way we had to treat these guys. And now I I have somebody walk in my office every day with a new drug, and it's just amazing. And all these drugs, like you talked about, the PARP inhibitors that y'all used for ovarian cancer have now marched up to the front of the line. Right. Same thing has happened with abiaterone. Same thing's going to happen with these PARP inhibitors and all these new anti-androgen. So it's real. And now they're putting them in a combo pill. So the guys, instead of having taken like five pills, are going to just have to take one. It's all in one pill. It's right. It's just crazy. So. And then, you know, we are all, you know, especially as you said, for those high and intermediate risks, doing that somatic testing for the tumor. What I love about it when, um, they we're talking about these new drugs, I will pay attention to the prostate cancer drugs. Right. Yeah, because yeah. then, you know, you know when you know, it comes down the road, yeah. if it's an anti hormone therapy, yeah. particularly working in the brain or you know, or somewhere on the higher on the hormone pathway, like I know eventually it will also make it to our uterine cancer patients right. and yeah. you know, continue All to all the hormone um, sensitive cancers. So right. yeah, and it's um I it's just it's amazing. And I um I get excited about the about when I go to the conferences and stuff like going in and seeing all these new like 
they're using that for that. Like it's just it's amazing that they can that we what we've done in the past ten years. So, yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to switch back to talking a little bit about those grade one cancers. You sure. know, we know that obesity is related to uterine cancer, and I think most of the public now is aware of that. We don't talk a whole lot about obesity in the relationship to prostate cancer. Sure. What would you say to that? Yeah. I mean, I think if you look at prostate cancer risk and um, we look at where it's found in the world, right? So obesity in America is one of the – it's either our diet, our obesity – or something that we're exposed to. Well, if you take take a man that is that has a low risk in another country and you move him to America and you feed him our diet and he becomes overweight, he has the same risk factors that we do. So obesity drives – I mean, I think it's probably the same mechanism that drives it in uterine mm-hmm. cancer. The obesity aromatase is testosterone. It increases estrogen. You know, it's it's exposing those, those uh, prostate – cells to different hormones that they would not normally get and it's causing a it's causing a mutation that causes a cancer talking about low grade cancers i think that's a, been a big shift is just in not treating some of them too just like heart disease just like everything in america right if we could get obesity under control we would see our rates of uterine cancer prostate cancer probably breast cancer colon cancer i mean heart disease go down yeah. i mean you know if you look at the mediterranean diet there's a reason that that diet works well for preventing cancer. It's because all those people are not overweight. It's not the diet. It's the amount that they eat and their exercise and everything else. So. Yeah. And well, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think the main thing that we want people to find motivation. And right. I think prevention of prostate yeah, cancer exor- is one that is not often mentioned on the nightly news in terms of benefits of yeah. obesity prevention and having a healthy diet. And I think that's one that would be high on men's list. Well, and I'll tell you, this is what motivates men, right? So you you want to prevent your prostate cancer, sure. But if you want to improve your erections, exercise and lose weight, because that'll improve your erections too. So I think that should be and the tagline of the that, show. That's right. <laughs> if you want to improve your erections, exercise and lose weight. So, yeah. Uh, but talking about low grade cancer, if you want to talk about that for a second, so we came out with PSA in the '90s. We screened everybody, and we found all these cancers. Mm-hmm. Um, so now we have all these guys that have low grade cancer, and we said, well, we can now we can treat everybody and prevent them from dying of cancer. Which it, there there uh, there's no doubt that the data supports that detecting all that early uh, impacted a lot of guys' lives. Um, for, for the good as far as as far as far saving their life. Uh, but we what we did find was that there were a lot of guys that probably got treated that did not need treatment. And they had low-risk cancer. They probably were not going to ever progress. Um, there was a guy, his name's Tom Klotz. He's in Toronto. Um, that I remember him coming to a, a, a conference, and he basically got laughed off the stage for just talking about watching prostate cancer. And he's got a, he's got a huge active surveillance population. And, you know, he's in Canada and, you know, socialized medicine and everybody's like just, I mean, it was like get the pitchforks out and the torches, you know. Right. And um, now he's a genius, right? So now he's like the expert on active surveillance. And so it's really interesting to watch his career as I've, as I've grown and go to, to see him talk on these different topics. And, and active surveillance is like the preferred method of treatment for low-risk prostate cancer. So I think that's one thing to drive home to men, too, is that just because you get diagnosed does not necessarily mean you need treatment, but it, in, in active surveillance is, a, I mean, really is a form of treatment. You're coming to the doctor, you're getting tested to make sure that it's not progressing, um, but it doesn't ruin your life. It doesn't ruin your career. It doesn't like, you know, I see patients like that, well, I'm a captain of a ship or whatever, and I don't want to be diagnosed because it, they may not let me do that anymore. That's not going to happen. Uh, I fly airplanes. Like, that's, right. you know, I like to do that, but i Patients do that, and they like, I'm going to lose my medical. Well, that's not going to happen if you're on active surveillance. So I think that's an important thing for men to, to understand, too, is just because you get diagnosed doesn't necessarily mean you, tr- need, you need treatment. So Absolutely. And then to go to that opposite end, we've talked some on this show at, about the triple negative breast cancer, the kind of highest risk right. breast cancer. What's the prostate cancer equivalent of that, and and how does that look from a treatment perspective? Yeah, so um, so prostate cancer is graded. So we can go into the the academic part of this really good, but I would just simplify it. You may hear a, a term called Gleason score. 
Um, we are trying to get away from Gleason scoring because it's really confusing, and most urologists don't even understand it. Um, if I ask our residents, that that's a favorite quiz question. Like, explain Gleason scoring to me. So we've gone to grade grouping, and so we group guys in kind of one through five, and five being the highest risk. Most of that has to do with cellular architecture, um, and so and so we use that grade group and then use that in combination with imaging and PSA testing to stage them. So much like triple negative, we don't have we don't have those hormone receptors that we can look at for triple negative like that. Um, we don't have that strong of a correlation between hormone receptor positivity and treatment effect. Okay. So for those guys that are high risk, I mean, it depends on the guy's uh, function, right? So a lot of guys that are high risk, they're elderly, they, they come in with high risk disease. We may just offer them treatment, you know, hormone deprivation, which, you know, means basically chemical castration. You can do it surgically still, but most guys prefer just shots or, or pills to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's usually the mainstay of those high risk patients if they are curable. So one of the, I think one of the other things that we could talk about is how imaging's revolutionized prostate cancer treatment. But if they're curable, say they have a PET scan that's negative mm-hmm. um, and we, we're treating them for localized prostate cancer, sometimes for high risk, it's radiation with hormone deprivation, like we mm-hmm. talked about. Um, sometimes it's surgery um, mm-hmm. followed by radiation with hormone deprivation. So you can con- kind of combine that. There's not a there's not a one size fits all for that for that population, um, and really, there's not a one size fits all for any of the population because there's so many different treatment options out there. I think that's that's another te- that's an but that could be a whole another episode is just treatment options for prostate cancer. Absolutely. And while we have you talk mm-hmm. briefly about imaging revolutionizing prostate yeah, cancer so treatment. Yeah. So imaging. So there's been a ton of changes that, like in the past five years for imaging, really in the past two, we now have what's called PSMA PET scan. A PSMA is prostate specific membrane antigen. So it's a, it's a receptor on the prostate, only on prostate cells or in prostate cancer cells that you can attach a radio nucleotide to and do uh, nuclear medicine imaging. We used to do it via bone scan it's not as sensitive. CT scan would show you the architecture. The bone scan would show you the the uh, radiation effect or the radionucleotide effect. And doing that together in the PET scan allows us to do PET scan for prostate cancer. So we never have been able to do that before. Several Very years ago, cool. they came out with another one, and they keep coming out with these that are being more and more sensitive. So now almost if your PET scan's negative, I mean, you're, you're pretty much negative. You're good. Yeah. What's really cool is now they're able to use PSMA – PET to target radiation therapy so they can do radiotherapy with PSMA PET and what's really cool is a new drug that came out that is that you can it's got a lethal radiation ligand attached to that PSMA molecule so it gets delivered inside the cell essentially it's like I mean it's like putting a stick of dynamite in the cell I mean it's really cool. So, that is incredibly cool. Yeah. So you can you're you're using targeted therapy. You're using radiation as a targeted agent. That's uh, mind blowing. Mind blowing yeah. beyond. Yeah. 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 So. so, Chris, September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Tell us, kind of, to finish us up, what you want men to know about prostate cancer. This conversation and sure. Um, I always tell everybody when you start seeing football on TV, it's time to get your prostate checked. Okay, I love so that. I, that's that's the, the cue um, when you see football. Just like we October is breast cancer awareness, right? right. So, and when football season comes on, it's time to get your prostate checked. Man up, get checked. You're not being a, a strong guy by trying to to hide it. So just go get checked and 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 see where you stand for from your risk cancers risk of prostate cancer. A lot of guys don't need to be checked, and you may come to the office and or see one of us and be like, "Oh no, you'd come back in five years," you know. Yeah. Um, so I th- it's a simple blood test. Um, you may need to have a rectal exam, so but uh, it's it's probably more likely that you won't initially. Um, and so I say, just don't be scared and go get checked. And if you talk to somebody that's had it, that's been treated, they'll tell you that it's a much easier process than they thought it would be. So. So, Chris, we can't talk about screening without talking about this effort that we've been doing recently to get Thanks more. To you. Me. Thanks to you. I yeah. cannot take credit. <laughs> CDC, Alabama Department of Public Health, the mobile unit, Miss Janelle Lohman, also a previous guest on the podcast. But 
there's a lot of effort being put forward to get more men screened with PSA out in the community. Yeah, absolutely. I think where we live particularly, and, and we're not unique to this, but there is a huge problem with access to care. So you may have a lot of men around that may hear this podcast that want to get screened but don't know how to. And so having oh, some having an outreach in the community to allow that's uh, really good to, to allow them to access the system. So Absolutely. And, you know, unfortunately, not enough of our safety nets, not enough of our safety nets capture men, especially right. men before they reach the Medicare age. Right. And just like with the NFL, they've done a great job with like touting breast cancer and supporting breast cancer. We haven't really done a whole great job with supporting prostate cancer awareness. And so um, a lot of men don't even know where their prostate is. So getting somebody to go out into the community, having the resources to do that getting the funding to do that, which I applaud you guys for because y'all worked really hard to do that, is going to impact a lot of lives. Well, we're super hopeful it'll continue to be um, re-upped every year. Yeah, hope to. I know we've covered a lot today. Where would you send men for more information? So our website's a good good one to start, usahealthsystem.com. I try to tell people to stay off Google. You'll scare yourself to death on there and get some kind of bad advice. Uh, Urologycarefoundation.org is another great uh, resource just generally. But if you're trying to locally find someone, I think our, our, um, our website's a good one. Call our office if you can't, you know, 660-5930, 251-660-5930. And we can help get you into the right place as well. Excellent. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming into the studio this morning. It's so exciting to hear all these new developments. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope you found today's discussion as informative and inspiring as I did. A huge thank you to Dr. Keel for sharing his invaluable insights on men's health and prostate cancer. Remember, screening and awareness are the key. And I love how he said, when you see football on TV, it's time to get your prostate checked. What a great reminder. I'll give you a little hint about myself. I always get my mammograms in my birthday month, which is April. And I know that when school starts, if I haven't done it by then, I am overdue. So guys, remember when football starts, that's when you're due for your prostate screening. And if you haven't had it done by the national championship or the Super Bowl, whichever team you follow, then you're overdue. For those of you with men in your life, we'd love for you to share this episode with your friends and family and help spread the word about the importance of men's health. Until next time, keep cancering and take care of yourself. Thanks again for listening. And don't forget to submit your questions at www.cancering.com. We're here for all of those questions and we'll get you the answers. This show is brought to you by the University of South Alabama Mitchell Cancer Institute. MCI is a cutting edge cancer research and patient center built to fight cancer smarter in Mobile and Baldwin County, Alabama. Our researchers and clinicians focus daily on the struggle against cancer, serving a potential catchment population of more than 4.1 million people. With a singular focus of advancing cancer diagnosis, treatment, and prevention throughout the Gulf Coast and beyond with science, technology, and hope. Want to know more about the Mitchell Cancer Institute? Visit us at usamci.com or search for us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Mitchell Cancer Institute is a member of USA Health. To learn more about all of our hospitals, clinics, and services, visit usahealthsystem.com. 